This is Ari Koretsky and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. We are here with Nat Lewin, renowned attorney, man who has been engaged in the legal sphere at the highest levels for decades, and we're very, very excited to welcome Nat to the program. Thank you for joining us, Nat Lewin. You're welcome. My full name is Nathan. Nathan and Lewin. The interesting thing is I've always been called Nat, although people insist that the short for Nathan is Nate. Nat, they say, my full name must be Nathan. It's not. My full name is Nathan, and people have called me Nat ever since I can remember. I think Where, it was my where did that come from? So I think it was my mother who uh, first began using the term, the word Nat, and it just stuck. <laughs> well, you, you've definitely been uh, a Nat, so to speak, in the face of many uh, adversaries legally. I know that. Perhaps it was a uh, prescient nickname. Uh, so Nat, w tell us a little bit about where you grew up, what your childhood was like. Of course, I want to get into your your legal career and all of the, the fabulous stories that you've been a part of. But just contextualize that a little bit for us. What was your childhood like? Well, I don't remember much of my childhood because I was born in Poland uh, a couple of years before the outbreak of the war, of World War II. I was three years old when Hitler marched into Poland. I was born in Lodz, which was the second largest in Poland. And uh, my mother... Allah Shalom was Dutch, really. She was raised in Amsterdam. And uh, her father, my maternal grandfather, whom I do not recall because he was killed in Auschwitz, he was a great admirer of my paternal grandfather, my father's father, who was the chief rabbi of the Polish city of Zeshuv, known in Yiddish as Reisha, in southern Poland, in Galicia. My grandfather was not only a great Talmud Chacham, a great Talmudic scholar, and wrote books and responsa, but was also a leader of the Jewish community in Poland and was elected twice to the Polish parliament to the same. Uh, an introduction to one of his works on Torah, he wrote thanking the Polish government for giving him first class travel on the train from Jeshuv to Warsaw because that way he was able he had a table at which he was able to sit and write his uh, manuscript of the Torah commentaries that were published uh, four volumes were published before the war broke out the last one being published the summer of 1939 and in the introduction to that he said the rest of Bamidbar, and uh, we understood the rest of the commentaries on Devarim were really written, would be out very soon. And then, of course, came the war, the manuscript was lost, and my grandfather himself was murdered June 30th, July 1st, 1941, in the city of Lvov, to which he had escaped from Jeshu, because he knew he was at the top of Hitler's wanted list and if they had found him they would have murdered him instead he escaped to the eastern part of poland under russian domination and when the russians left and the germans were coming in the very kind ukrainians conducted a pogrom killed two thousand jews in one day and among them was my grandfather and his brother who was also a rabbi in the world so both well, of I don't, your grandparents. I don't know much about my childhood, um, except that uh, we escaped from Poland. I heard stories about how I was carried through the woods as we smuggled into Lithuania. Uh, my mother, who very, very bright and very perceptive and very modern, is really the person who gets credit for having saved the mirror yeshiva and 2,000 families that had escaped to Vilna from Poland because she got the first of the visas by the Japanese consul, Shuni Sugihara. Sugihara. And Sugihara's uh, visas are very famous. Japanese consul in Kaunas, 
who uh, hand wrote visas for Jews who were escaping from the Nazis. And that, those visas enabled us and more than 2,000 other families to travel from Vilna to Moscow, from Moscow to Vladivostok, and from Vladivostok to Japan. And those who had permission to come to the United States, as my father did, because he was a well-known figure also in the Jewish community in Poland, could come to the United States. But the other Jews who used the Sugihara visas to get to Japan could not come to the United States, and they ended up being transferred to Shanghai. Oh, yeah. well, that famous Jewish community of Shanghai, including the Mary Yeshiva, spent the war in Shanghai, basically. Did your mother have any relationship to the yeshiva, the Mir yeshiva? How did, did she help inform them of this, you know, possible escape route? Her only brother, whose name was Leo or Levi, was a student at the Mir yeshiva. And he uh, was involved in getting the Sugihara visa. As a matter of fact, the list of that Sugihara that the uh, foreign office maintained in Tokyo, Sugihara visas has my father, Polish citizen, being given a Sugihara visa, my mother's brother, Levi Sternheim, a Dutch citizen, being given a Sugihara visa, and my mother's mother, Rachel Sternheim, being given a Sugihara visa. And Levi, Leo, went back and told his Chavrusa and others at the yeshiva, in the Mary Yeshiva, about this. And that was the reason that the Mary Yeshiva, in large numbers, traveled to Kaunas, to Kovno, and got visas from Sugihara because my uncle had been a student at the Mary Yeshiva. He did not have permission to come to the United States, as did my father. So from Japan, he and his mother, my grandmother, went to the Dutch East Indies because they were Dutch citizens and therefore they had a right to go to the Dutch East. My grandmother survived the war in a civilian camp after the Japanese conquered Java and Sumatra and took, put the Dutch citizens into a civilian camp. My uncle, Leo, ended up in the Dutch military over there in the Dutch East Indies and was killed fighting the Japanese and is buried on an island off of Java. Incredible story. So did your family end up in New York? Where, where did they land? Well, we, of course, landed first in San Francisco because the boat from Japan took us to San Francisco. I entered the United States through San Francisco. Ultimately, shortly thereafter, we did settle in New York and in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And uh, I was an only child. My parents were not going to let me go off traveling on public transportation on my own. There was a school that had a school bus that was known as the Ramaz School. It's still very famous on the sure. east side of Manhattan. So my parents sent me to Ramaz on the school bus. And I went through the eighth grade in Ramaz and then went to Yeshiva University High School, also known as Talmudical Academy, and then to Yeshiva College. And after Yeshiva College, I made it to the Harvard Law School. There's a story story there too because the Yeshiva College graduates were uh, successful at that point already in getting admitted to Harvard and Yale Law School. And because Yale was so close to New York and I thought I would be able to come back to New York each weekend for Shabbos with my parents, we first I first accepted the invitation of the Yale Law School to go to Yale. And it wasn't until my actual graduation from Yeshiva College, and in those days, the entering classes to law school were not determined until sometime in the summer, really. So I'd been admitted to Yale, I accepted to go to Yale, and then at my graduation, the only lawyer I knew, I knew, I didn't really know what lawyers did. <laughs> a classmate of mine, father, was a lawyer out in Haverstraw, New York. And this lawyer said to me at the time of graduation, uh, Nathan, you're doing so well. I mean, I was valedictorian of my class and had a good record. What are you doing with yourself? I said to him, Mr. Miller, I'm very proud. I'm going to law school. He said, well, what law school are you going to? I said, very proudly. I said, I'm going to Yale Law School. 
And he looked at me and he said, well, it's too bad you were not admitted to Harvard. I said, <laughs> I wasn't admitted to Harvard. As a matter of fact, Harvard has given me a full scholarship if I were to go there. Scholarship. In those days, the tuition for law school was $1,000 a year. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Harvard, Harvard had given me, offered me a full scholarship. And I said this, I said, look, I was admitted to Harvard. And this only lawyer I knew, the only lawyer I knew said to me, Nathan, if you were admitted to Harvard Law School and you don't go to the Harvard Law School, you are crazy. <laughs> I remember he said those words, you are crazy. Was he a Harvard alum? No, he was not. But he was a great admirer, I guess, of Harvard Law School. And so I went home and I said to my father, you know, the only lawyer I know, Mr. Miller, says I'm crazy if I don't go to the Harvard Law School. And my father said, Harvard, that's in Boston. Can you keep kosher in Boston? I said, well, let me find out. My father did not, although he knew Rabbi Soloveitch, he right. didn't put two together. Um, Can you keep kosher in Boston? Well, I found out that there was an apartment of Yeshiva College graduates. There were three fellows. One was a law school student who became the first dean of the bar Ilan Law School, Arnold Enker. And then there was a chemistry student at Harvard by the name of Samuel Danishevsky, who went on to become a brilliant chemist and really was, I, from all I understand, really a runner-up for the Nobel Prize in chemistry, but just, just missed being the Nobel laureate in chemistry. So Sam Danishevsky and Arnold Anker and another fellow by the name of Arnold Knoll all had this apartment and they kept kosher and they had four beds in the apartment and were looking for a fourth roommate. And there, there he was. I showed up. So that's how I ended up going to the Harvard Law School. I'm sure Yale is still kicking itself for their loss. Well, yeah, instead of me, Yale got, the two years later, got a fellow by the name of Alan Dershowitz, and he's done pretty well. Although years. he ended up teaching at Harvard, so. <laughs> but he graduated Yale. Interesting. <laughs> what do you think propelled you to study law? You said you didn't even really know any lawyers, one, you know, random, uh, or parent of a friend. One of, one of the things that propelled me was that I did not like the sight of blood. I didn't think I would possibly be a doctor. So what was left to do? My father, as a matter of fact, had gotten a law degree in Poland. He never practiced law, but he did get a doc, a Juris doctor, and that's why he was always known as Dr. Isaac Lewin, because he did get a doctorate at the University of Lvov in law. So if I thought of what I was going to do as a livelihood, I figured, all right, law sounds as good as anything else. But I assume, if you ask me what lawyers do, I knew that lawyers appear in court because I would read Perry Mason novels, <laughs> and those were very interesting. But I was I never thought I would ever appear in court. I thought the lawyers who don't appear in court sit in their office, and people come, and they say to them, look, what is the law on such? And the lawyer tells them what the law is and gives them a bill. And they pay the bill, and that's how the lawyer survives, because he tells <laughs> what the law is. I, that, I, that was like kind of, uh, in yeshiva, you know, you ask a question, and you get a sock, you get a response. I figured that's what lawyers do. They sit in their office, and they answer questions about what the law is. I guess you quickly learned that was not the case. I learned that very quickly. I learned, as a matter of fact, the first class I, I remember I had at the Harvard Law School it was a property class, I, and we read a case, you know, it was, this was very serious business. I mean, I was going to law school, and I got these very heavy books, and you were supposed to read the case, the decision by the court, and I read it, and I assumed, from my Talmudic background, that a decision of a court was like the Talmudic Mishnah. I mean, it was the rule sort of being laid down in the case. And then I showed up in the class and the professor called on some unfortunate guy in class. In our class of 500, by the way, there were 490 men and 10 women. Hmm. Uh, so he called on some guy. In those days, women did not go to law school. The dean of the Harvard Law School thought that every seat that a woman was taking was wasted. 
because he was absolutely sure that women would never become lawyers, that they were only going to the Harvard Law School to find a Harvard lawyer to marry. And so there were 10 women in the whole class of 500. Anyway, some not, fellow- Not quite enough husbands, <laughs> not quite enough wives, I mean. Yeah, right. for... So uh, some fellow gets called on and the professor says, to him after he has him recite the facts of the case and what the court ruled, he says, uh, well, do you think the decision was right? I thought that was so stupid. I mean, what do you mean is the decision right? That's the halacha, that's the law. You can't be asking whether it's right. So over the course of the year, I gradually came to understand that the purpose of a law school education was to make you think about the situations and what the factors were that would make a decision right or wrong. Did you ever consider becoming a rabbi? Yes, I did. My father was pressing for that because we have generations, really, right. of rabbis in the family. My grandfather was the rabbi of Vesher. Before him, his father was the rabbi of Vesher. My great-grandfather's father-in-law was very famous, for, was known as Yitzchak, from Yitzchak Shmelkis, uh, who was a great posek, uh, chief rabbi of Lev, uh, at the turn of the 20th century. So my father was urging me maybe to become a rabbi. My father had good friends in the United States who were rabbis and very highly respected. And my father's view was this is a, you know, a very respectable, good, intellectually interesting thing to do. And, but I, A, I did not want to be a practicing rabbi. And B, I, I guess I had sort of other interests. So I did not stay at the yeshiva for the smicha program. When I graduated college, I went on to law school. Right. I and mean, I've spent time since then in various ways, uh, learning, teaching Torah, but I never got smicha uh, People sometimes mistakenly call me rabbi, but I'm not a rabbi. Not yet, at least. <laughs> <laughs> when you were in Boston, uh, you know, you mentioned that there was Rabbi Soloveitchik, who was, a, of course, one of the great rabbinic leaders of the 20th century in America. He lived in Boston, although he commuted to New York often, but was based in Boston. To my knowledge, you also had the, uh, the Boston Rebbe, a great Hasidic Rebbe. I don't know if he had yet arrived there by that time. Did you have connections with any of these luminaries during your law school years there? Yes, not as much as probably in retrospect I should have had, but I went at different times to Shiorim that Rabbi Soloveitchik gave. I did go to the Boston Rebbe, and later on in life, uh, uh, we became closer uh, after he uh, also settled in Israel. I mean, I saw him there. And Rabbi Soloveitchik knew me not because I was in the, but because I was my father's son. And I guess maybe he knew different people uh, from yeshiva. I mean, one story I can tell you, chance encounter with Rabbi Soloveitchik on an airplane. Years later, uh, I spent one year as a visiting professor from practice at the Harvard Law School. This was 1974, 75. And it turned out that year that I had a very busy private practice. The whole arrangement with Harvard for visiting professors from practice is that you could spend 50%, and frankly, I spent even more than that of your time in private practice while also giving classes at the law school. So I would commute from Boston, and then I had a high-profile client in New York by the name of Rabbi Bernard Bergman, who owned nursing homes in New York uh, and was the target of all criminal investigations and criminal prosecutions. I represented him. I would commute from Boston to New York and from New York to Washington and then back to regular flights. And one time I'm on the shuttle flight. I get on, in those days you were able to get on the plane. There was no security really, you got on the plane. They even sold the t tickets on the plane itself. The stewardess would go through with a cart and would take your credit card and, you you know, you would charge $25 or some cheap price for the flight from Boston to New York. And I'm sitting there on the plane 
And suddenly who walks down the aisle and takes the seat next to me, recognizes me, sits down next to me, is Rabbi Soloveitchik. So we had to have a conversation and the plane takes off and he says to me, so Lewin, uh, what are you doing? Tell me something interesting that you're doing. And I was very proud at that point of the fact that I had been involved and gotten federal legislation that protected Sabbath observers in private employment. If you were privately employed, until the statute was enacted, an employer could say, my regular work week requires every employee to be there five days a week till six at night. And I'm sorry, if you keep the Sabbath, you've got to still be there till six o'clock at night. And if you can't do that, we'll fire you. Or you're going to be away for Jewish holidays. I'm sorry, we don't allow that. Uh, we'll tell you when you can take your vacation. So I drafted a statute that was enacted in 1973 that said that an employer has to make reasonable accommodations to an employee's religious observance. And that's a federal statute? Pardon, federal statute. It's part of the Federal Civil Rights Act. And so it's, it was legislative, not, not judicial? It was legislative, right, because the Supreme Court had divided four to four on the question of whether the word religious civil rights act as initially enacted meant religious observance and practice, or whether it meant only you're Jewish, you're, you, this is your religion, this is how you were born. But it didn't have anything to do with how you practiced your religion. So I drafted language which Congress enacted as an amendment to the Civil Rights Act that protected Shomrei Shabbos because if you were a Sabbath observer, the employer had to make a reasonable accommodation to your religious observer. So when Rabbi Soloveitchik says to me, what have you done? I said, oh, let me tell you what I've done. I've gotten a statute enacted that protects Sabbath observers, and it means that if you won't work Friday afternoons in the winter, if you have to go home at 3 o'clock, the employer can't keep you from going home at 3 o'clock. You, you know, you have to maybe take annual leave, but nonetheless, you have a right for your religious observance or for religious holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, whatever, you can take off. I explained that very proudly to Rabbi Soloveitchik. When I was shocked when Rabbi Salvechik turned to me, he said, well, is that fair? What do you mean, is that fair? He says, well, why does somebody else who doesn't have a religious reason can't take off for some other reason that he may have, but for a religious reason you can take off? Is that fair? This was a real shock. I mean, <laughs> with it from Rabbi Salvechik, is it fair to be able to take off fr early on Friday? But I said, yeah, that's religion. It's protected by the Constitution. It's part of American society, religious observance. Well, we had this whole discussion on the plane, and he was not really satisfied. And when we finished, his feeling was that this had a certain element of unfairness to it. If you're a Sabbath observer, so you have to suffer the consequences. That's all. It's uh, hard to be a Jew, but so what? It deflated me, certainly, but the other thing was that years later, a majority of the Supreme Court agreed with it. I mean, I had a case in the Supreme Court which involved a Connecticut statute that said that you could not be forced to work on your Sabbath. I represented not a Jew, but a Sabbath-observing Baptist who would not work on a Sunday observing Baptist who would not work on Sunday. And I argued that case in the Supreme Court together with, of all people, Joe Lieberman, who was then the Attorney General of Connecticut. And we lost that case in the Supreme Court precisely for the reason that Rabbi Soloveitchik had said. The Supreme Court said it's not fair and the First Amendment does not permit a state to say that you have an absolute right to take off on your Sabbath. The Supreme Court said because the Connecticut law was absolute, nobody could be forced for any reason to work on their Sabbath. My law, which I had drafted, said you have to make a reasonable accommodation mm. so that if an employer could say, it would be unreasonable to force me to give somebody off 
on Friday night, if, for example, he's a star of a Broadway show and there's huge audiences coming in over the weekend, and Friday night, a lot of tickets are being sold, and he's going to tell me he's a Sabbath observer. And then, of course, I always thought that that was a perfect illustration of when I couldn't say it was reasonable to take off on Friday night. And then years later, Dudu Fisher did exactly that when he was, uh, I think, in Les Mis or some big Broadway musical, was a star and took off on Friday nights and Saturdays because he was Shomer Shabbos. So was the Supreme Court saying that your statute that you had drafted was unconstitutional? And, or, no, 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 no. My statute is still the law. As a matter of fact, I'm just engaged now in working on a petition to the Supreme Court for somebody who I think should have been protected by that statute. Okay. What the Supreme Court said was unconstitutional was, if it's not to reasonableness, but it is absolute. It simply says, Chief Justice Berger said in his opinion in that case, it puts the Sabbath observer in the driver's seat. Mm. Uh, Observer has a right, no matter what anybody else says, to take off on Saturday or Friday afternoon, whether it's reasonable or not. That's so the Connecticut the statute was was struck down, not the federal. The Connecticut statute was struck down, even though the Attorney General of Connecticut, by the name of Joseph Lieberman, <laughs> tell the Supreme Court that the Connecticut court would not read it as being absolute. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court said we read it. And as we did, it's absolute, and therefore it's unconstitutional. Unbelievable. So what did you do after law school? Did you go right into private practice? At what point did you get no, no, begin no, no. getting after engaged? School, it's still true that, you know, honors graduates at law schools clerk for federal judges or for the Supreme Court of the United States. And that was desirable also in the class of 1960 at the Harvard Law School. I was in the class of 1960. It's a very distinguished class. I mean, members of that class were Justice Antonin Scalia, who was a classmate of mine, Michael Dukakis, who ran for president. <laughs> sure. Of mine. Didn't do too well in that election, I remember. No, he didn't. But I voted for him because he was a classmate. I thought there was a certain obligation to support a classmate. I think his wife had some issues, right, that undid him. Well, he had some issues in terms of how he answered regarding what would happen if somebody assaulted his wife. He was too weak on that and was appropriately criticized for that. But it was a very distinguished class. It had a number of people with deputies, attorney general, the chief judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit of Belmont, and Richard Arnold, was in that class. It, it was one of the finest Harvard Law School class. I think the fact they agreed that in the history of the Harvard Law School. So I ended up the year after I graduated, I clerked for the chief judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in New York, and also was called and asked whether I would be interested in clerking for Justice John Harlan of the Supreme Court. Of course, I was very interested. <laughs> I was told to go down to Washington to meet with Justice Harlan, and if we got along, I would be the Harvard Law School graduate recommended to be his law clerk. The problem was that in those days, each justice had two law clerks. Now each justice has four law clerks. In those days, with two law clerks, the Supreme Court generally considered about 150 cases a year. Now, with four law clerks, they decide 75 cases oh my. a year. You figure out the mathematics. Yeah. Of that. I'm not a math guy, but I think that's four times the caseload. So with two law clerks, but the rule was that the law clerks were expected to be at the Supreme Court and working from Monday through Saturday and Sunday off. So I knew that, and I said to Justice Harlan when I met him, and we had a very nice discussion. Uh, he was a magnificent man. He and his wife had coming to our wedding at the Fifth Avenue Synagogue because I got married the summer after I clerked. But I said to Justice Harlan in our first interview, I, after we had a terrific discussion, I said, Justice Harlan, I have to tell you the truth, which is that I am a Sabbath observer. And I know that the work week for law clerks is supposed to be from Monday through Saturday. I can't be here on Saturdays, and I have to leave early on Fridays. This was before you had written your statute. 
Yes, uh, and the statute would not have applied in any event to the Supreme Court, clerkship on the Supreme Court. It applies to There's more than 12 employees. But in any event, I said that to him, and I thought he would tell me what a lot of the New York law firms that I interviewed with for jobs, which had rejected me, said to me, young man, you've got a fine record. You obviously are very bright, but if you want to be a lawyer, go back to your rabbi and get a dispensation from your rabbi. But you can't be a lawyer if you're not going to be able to work Friday evenings or on Jewish holidays. So I was told, get a dispensation. So I figured the Supreme Court of the United States, I'm going to get that same line from Justice Harlan, get a dispensation from the rabbi. And I had thought of what I would have to say to him. You can't get dispensations. I'm sorry. Justice Harlan never said that. As soon as I told him I would not be available on Saturdays, he said to me, well, are you available on Sundays? And he said, sure, I'd be happy to come in on Sundays. He said, well, I have two law clerks. Your co-clerk, I'll expect him to be in on Saturday, and I'll expect you to be in on Sunday. That was a terrific solution. It turned out that my co-clerk, John Rylander, who passed away a couple of years ago, was a very, very fine lawyer, had high positions in the government when he was a senior practitioner. John Rhinelander's grandfather was the Anglican Bishop of Pennsylvania. And Mark, uh, Justice Harlan, when he would rest into his chambers to show them around, frequently he would come into the room where John Rhinelander and I were sitting and working away, and he would introduce us to who, whoever his guest was, and he would say, more than once, this was a repeated refrain. He would say, I'd like you to meet my law clerks. Here's John Rhinelander, whose grandfather is the Anglican Bishop of Pennsylvania. And here's Nat Lewin, whose grandfather was the leading rabbi in Poland, in pre-war Poland. So that's why I would be introduced <laughs> by Justin Harlan, who had a great appreciation of grandfathers because his grandfather was the first John Harlan. And the first John Harlan was very famous because he dissented in the famous case of Plessy versus Ferguson. Plessy versus Ferguson was the separate case but equal. That's right, that you could have separate but equal. And John Harlan, the first, the grandfather of the John Harlan for whom I work, said, No, no, you can't be, if you're separate, you're not equal. I have that, John, I don't know whether you can see it, but. I have a picture of Justice Harlan, which he signed over to me right up here, hanging on the wall. So. Wow. So how did you go from there to being someone who seems to constantly be arguing high-profile cases in front of the Supreme Court? How did your career take the turn of, of you taking on these major landmark cases? What was kind of the first maybe breakthrough case that you worked on, and, and what sort of capacity was it as a private practitioner or as part of some larger group? Well, I had the also good fortune of being invited when I, after I clerked to work at the Department of Justice and being asked after a year in the criminal division where I was sent down to be part of the criminal team, the prosecution team that was prosecuting Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, and I went to Nashville for that purpose. But then when I came back, I was invited by Archibald Cox, who was Solicitor General of the United States, to join his office. At that point, the Solicitor General had nine or maybe eight lawyers working for him. Now the Solicitor General's office is, I think, 25 or 30 lawyers, but in those days it was eight plus the Solicitor General. And Archibald Cox, who had been a professor at Harvard, was an outstanding Solicitor General magnificent in terms of oral arguments before the court, very hard worker, great legal analyst, terrific writer, and I joined his staff, and in that capacity had the opportunity to argue, I think it was 12 cases over a period of a couple of years in the Supreme Court for the government of the United States, and that was great experience, and when I went out into private practice, because I had this Solicitor General background and had argued cases in the Supreme Court, including from the prosecution's standpoint, the case involving JFO where we convicted him and then he took the case to the Supreme Court. So I was, to some extent, a Supreme Court specialist 
after my years in the Department of Justice. I was in the Department of Justice in the Office of the Solicitor General. I was over at the State Department for a year, which happened to be 1967, the year of the Six Day War in Israel. And there's a whole range of stories regarding that when I was at the State Department during the Six Day War, then went back to the Justice Department as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. And I was in that capacity when Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I was really in charge of the investigation to try to find the assassin of Martin Luther King, a man by the name of James Earl Ray, who we ultimately found after many days almost more than 60 days, he was tracked down to London and extradited from London to the United States. So I had all that experience. And then Richard Nixon was elected president and his administration that came in with John Mitchell as attorney general and a man by the name of Jerris Leonard as assistant attorney general in the civil rights division, they asked me to stay on. But the first boss I had had at the Department of Justice was a man by the name of Jack Miller, Herbert J. Miller, who when he left the Department of Justice after Jack Kennedy was assassinated and then Kennedy was assassinated, I had worked for Miller and then Miller called me up shortly after Nixon took over as president and said to me, you don't really want to work for Richard Nixon, do you? I said, well, I guess maybe not. <laughs> Well, I've formed a law firm, and maybe you want to come along. We'll make you a name partner. The firm was Miller, Cassidy, LaRocca, and Lewin. So I agreed to go into private practice as the last of those four names. The other three were lawyers who were not Jewish, but they had the patience and consideration to allow me to take on Jewish cases frequently for no fee, just on a pro bono basis. People ask me at the time, now, Lewin, you know, you argue cases in the Supreme Court. You're such a big macher. Why are you the last name of Miller, Cassidy, LaRocca, and Lewin? And my answer to that was, you don't understand. Most of my clients read from right to left. <laughs> but as a partner of Miller, Cassidy, LaRocca, and Lewin, which started as a four or five person firm that expanded ultimately. We got excellent young lawyers who would clerk for justices on the Supreme Court to agree to come with the firm and work with us. And frankly, I guess the kinds of cases that I got for the Jewish community, including, for example, a lot of litigation over the right to have a menorah in a public place in which I represented various other kinds of cases were the kinds of cases that really interested young lawyers. So they mm. would come with our firm and get experience in some of the interesting cases. Uh, the first Jewish case that I did in the Supreme Court was a legal action that, in which I represented the United Jewish Organizations of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, when what happened was the New York legislature divided an assembly district in which the Hasidic community in Williamsburg had all been able to together and elect a people to the New York legislature. And in a reapportionment, what they did is they divided it in half. The gerrymandering. I, yeah. I brought a lawsuit in which I said that was unconstitutional. You couldn't, on the basis of the race of the inhabitants of the district decide you were going to divide it in half so that this was deliberately done. They said it so that there would be two districts that would have majority of minorities of blacks and Hispanics in those two districts. So I brought that lawsuit and that lawsuit made its way to the Supreme Court of the United States. So that was maybe the first of a whole bunch of Jewish lawsuits that made their way to the Supreme Court of the United States in which I represented the Jewish interests. Then I had the Yamulka case, uh, the, the question of whether you had a right to wear a yarmulke in the military. The military, yeah. the military. And other cases, I had the Curious Joel case, which was the question of uh, representing the Satna village of Curious Joel, which had a publicly financed school for handicapped children. Was that constitutional? Is that a church-state issue? 
Yes, and then I have a Chabad Menorah case, which was the question of whether the Constitution was violated by the city of Pittsburgh allowing a Chabad Menorah to go up in front of City Hall next to a Christmas tree. And we won that case. The Supreme Court said it did not violate the Establishment Clause. But then we had a lot of litigation after that in which we had to establish that you could put up a Hanukkah menorah in any public forum so long as you had a sign that showed that it was a private menorah financed by Chabad and was not the city government that was paying for it. But that continues to be an issue that comes up every year at Hanukkah. There's some Chabad Shluchim who call or email me because in their city or town or village, the local authorities have decided they will not permit a menorah to go up on public property. So those kinds of cases were cases that people asked me to take on. Some of them were pro bono. Some of them, you know, I got paid for. But uh, and my partners were very patient in allowing me to do those. When it comes to these church-state type cases, you know, I know that's kind of a general fault line for many people. If, if there was like an overarching argument or way of describing a perspective on what the separation church state or the establishment clause means that obviously from your perspective allows for these you know various modes of expression how do you express that to people uh, in a way that explains that these are still within their constitutional rights and we're actually going to hold it there for this week that will be a great teaser i hope for next week's part two with famed attorney nathan lewin until then this has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews you should know.